Okay, so for pain, please keep in mind that this is <clears throat> purely subjective. Here's the definition of pain. We use Margot McCaffrey's definition, which is the one adopted by the American Pain Society. It's purely subjective, unpleasant sensory and emotional experience, and the best <clears throat> judge of the patient's pain, is it the doctor or the nurse? Neither. Who is the best judge? The patient. The person experiencing it is the best judge of the pain. So do we have a right to ask them to prove it to us? No. Here's our accepted definition. And it's hard to stand with this sometimes, but we need to understand what is our role regarding, regarding pain management. Okay, so this is... Because this is our definition, pain is whatever the person says it is, existing wherever they say it does. So therefore, we, do we have a right to have them prove it to us? So therefore, is are there signs and symptoms of pain? Yes. There are symptoms, yes. but do we have signs like vital signs? Yes. Yeah. No, yeah. it's purely, look at the definition again, purely subjective. Okay, so you can't say the patient's vital signs are normal and then you tell them, oh, you're BSing me. Your vital signs are totally normal. You're not in pain. Shut up. Can we do that? No, it's all, it's purely subjective. All right, are we, are we, are we clear with this? Yeah. All right. And we know the, the effects of pain on the body. It's not just psychological, it's, it's, it's physical as well. It's, um, it's hard to live with pain. We will never understand until we experience pain like some of our patients do. There are two major categories of pain. There can be acute or chronic. In chronic pain, doesn't mean they won't have acute episodes. Okay, so acute pain is not only the duration, but also the characteristic of the pain. Examples of acute pain are surgical pains or actual injuries. So let's say you have appendicitis, okay, you had trauma. So those are acute pain types. Chronic pain would be the first one we talked about last uh, two weeks ago was rheumatoid arthritis okay, or osteoarthritis, for instance. So those are chronic types of pain doesn't mean they won't have acute episodes. So if the patient has a chronic pain and they're taking medication for that, during episodes of acute breakthrough pain, we call those acute pain episodes that chronic pain sufferers experience as breakthrough pain. They will not respond to the usual long-acting opioids or whatever long-acting pharmacologic interventions they're using. We have to medicate it with something else. Are we clear? All right. So that's what we call breakthrough pain. So this is a different type of pain in between or sporadic episodes of acute pain occurring in patients with chronic pain. Right? And then they deserve treatment as well. You can't say, oh, you're already on morphine. Why would I give you anything else, okay? This is a different type of pain that they're experiencing on top of the chronic. So as far as pathology, meaning the cause of the pain, uh, there are also categories or classifications. We can either classify them as nociceptive. When we say nociceptive, there, there is a physiologic cause of the pain, meaning we can attribute the pain to, to a specific cause. Let's say there's tissue damage or there's trauma, or the patient has some infection, for instance, or inflammation. So that's nociceptive. Okay, the patient has a physiologic cause of the pain. There are pain receptors produced at the area, either local or systemically, causing the, the pain. So examples are the of these are muscle type pain, uh, organ, you know, let's say you have a stomach ache, you have cramps okay, during your period, those are all some uh, nociceptive pain, meaning there is a particular reason or cause of the pain. Neuropathic, however, 
are more abnormal pain sensations, meaning they do not follow normal pain pathways. If you do tests on the patient, do a CAT scan, do lab work, there's no explanation for the patient's pain, but yet they experience the pain. Examples of neuropathic pain is, let's say, shingles. You heard of people who have shingles, so that's neuropathic type. People with long-term diabetes, have you heard them complain of pain in their legs, but then there's nothing wrong physically with the leg? And then let's say another one is phantom limb pain. A phantom limb, meaning they're complaining of pain on the right foot, but yet they have no right foot. The, the leg has the right leg has been cut off, but then they keep saying, I'm telling you, there's my right foot hurts. Hey, I know it sounds crazy, but that's how I feel. So those are what we call neuropathic pain. So we, we treat each one specifically because they they do not follow specifically the the neuropathic types or classifications. They do not respond well to opioids or non-opioids. They have to be treated with a different type of medication. So these are the effects of pain. So it can affect you physiologically, not just causing depression, for instance. So let's say you're a 20-year-old with sickle cell anemia. Anyone familiar with sickle cell disease? Okay, so these people have frequent hospitalizations. They have chronic pain and they have acute pain during crisis episodes. Okay, so if they, they're in and out of the hospital, especially during the cold season, let's say they get three, four admissions for an entire fall or winter season, and you're 20 years old, how does that make you feel? You're missing work, you're missing school because of these hospitalizations. So what will you develop? Okay, you have depression, you have maladaptive, uh, disorders, right? You you develop mood disorders. You you you'll have uh, inability to cope. Okay? You'll you'll have impaired social interactions or relationships as a result. So it affects the whole body. We'll discuss later the effects, uh, the side effects of the treatment of opioids specifically uh, when we get to management. So these are the yeah, effects, table, oh, sorry, table effects are on table dash one and table dash two are the classifications. Okay, so these are combination or comparison between nociceptive, neuropathic, and mixed. Some people will have both. This part is not testable. The transduction, these are the pain processing mechanisms, meaning how do you experience pain? How does pain come about? So you can also um, refer to this as the, the um, uh, steps at which pain is experienced. First is transduction. Transduction meaning noxious stimuli, let's say uh, a burn, you know, some type of injury causes the release of neurotransmitters for pain. One of them is uh, substance P, or it could also be prostaglandin. Okay, these are neurotransmitters for pain. These are released by injured cells or tissues. And once they released in the bloodstream, they circulate in the brain and then they are interpreted as pain. So that's transduction. Again, this part is not uh, testable. This is just to help you understand later when we get to management, which part of the pain process is this pain intervention trying to interrupt? Remember the chain of infection? Yeah. Okay. So how do we prevent infection? By cutting the link right so cutting one of the chains either you cut it from the mode of transmission or you cut it from between 
the yeah the reservoir and uh, the uh, exit or let's say from um, protecting the susceptible host okay hand washing for instance okay so you need you only need to cut the link interrupt the chain and then there is no infection so same thing here so if you interrupt the pain the steps in the pain process let's say you stop it at transduction or you stop it at the next phase is transmission okay, so examples of transmission interruption mentioned here is let's say uh, massaging so they 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 theorize that small nerve fibers are through which pain impulses or other unpleasant sensations travel through, whereas large nerve fibers are through which pleasant sensations travel through. So if you stimulate large nerve fibers, so this will result in the, the euphoria you feel, let's say when you're watching a concert, for instance, you're, you're watching Coldplay or you're watching uh, Taylor Swift, whatever you're into, okay? or let's say eating chocolate or eating your favorite food. Hey, watching your favorite movie, right? So these are euphoric sensations, right? So these sensations, uh, listening to music, visual, any stimulation uh, that are pleasant travel through large nerve fibers, whereas the, the pain or, or sadness, for instance, all those unpleasant sensations travel through smaller nerve fibers. So which one is easier to stimulate, large or small? large because it's very easy because they're big you can easily stimulate them examples are men mentioned here are touch movement vibration okay so these are ways you can stimulate the large nerve fibers so let's say you remember when when the last time you hit your shin on something what did you do as soon as you hit it like this right Everybody, no matter what culture you are, everybody does that. Right? So the rubbing is you're stimulating the large nerve fibers, right? Through touch. And then how does that eliminate the pain? Always works, right? It works. Okay, so this is proof. Okay, so the, the you're interrupting the transmission by stimulating large nerve fibers. So therefore... Can it override the small nerve fiber stimulation? Yes. Yes. Um, so how does someone's psyche come into play with their pain threshold? Because like someone could have like a, a you know a, a high pain threshold. Well, that's totally subjective. Is, yeah. I is, mean you can have a really big muscular guy, but then has a very low pain threshold well what i'm saying is like sometimes someone could have a high pain threshold overall in general but if they've let's say been depressed for a long period of time oh yeah of course that will break a person threshold. down yeah so generally speaking women are known to have a really high pain threshold right i mean you guys are built for you know making babies delivery you know playing multiple roles right so you're you guys are tough um, guys, on the other hand, you know, get sick, act like a baby, like Mr. Weiss. Isn't that the worst? Yeah. Yeah, me too. <laughs> okay, so you can interrupt the transmission. Other ways you can interrupt the transmission is through nerve blocks. No, we, we put uh, anesthesia, mm -hmm. okay, epidural anesthesia, for instance. So that's a way to prevent the transmission of the impulses okay so different ways pharmacologic or non-pharmacologic finally with perception so you can alter the perception using opioids so you give them drugs in order to alter the sensation meaning the transmission transduction is there but the brain is tricked into there's no pain okay? <laughs> everything is good you're right yeah they can't feel anything huh? yeah so they're all drugged up Okay, so what we're in your we're changing is the perception. Okay, you can also alter it by by uh, yoga or meditation, for instance. So those are the non-pharmacologic means. But most in the hospital, 
I mean, can you do yoga if they're having appendicitis? Okay, let's do yoga. Right? <laughs> What's the intervention? Let's do yoga. No, okay. So some work, some do not. Yeah. What time is the psychological? Well, it's again, it's it. That's one of the. We'll we'll explain that later. Because that that will be one of the. Uh, aspects that would or factors that would make us ineffective in in managing pain meaning we judge people okay we which is which is not our role what is the definition of pain again okay whatever the patient says it is so who are we to to judge them right like ah that's all psychological it's in your head okay <clears throat> She said she has this itching, so she went to the doctor. The doctor gave her medication for the itching. Mm -hmm. Now, one time I tricked her, I gave, I said, Mom, here's your medication. I give her this. Medication. You mean like you did a placebo yeah. thing, right? Yeah. 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 She's like, girl, it's all the way, right? <laughs> uh, I can't say anything about that, but again, the patient um, <clears throat> is the best judge of their own pain. Okay, so don't please don't um well I can't control what you're what you do eventually in <laughs> in practice, but no. I'm just saying for the NCLEX, this is how we deal with pain. Are we clear? All right. Because I can't stop you. We, you when you're practicing your practitioners already, I mean, what can I do? Okay. You're outside the classroom already. It's not like I can take your license away. Let's go to the assessment now. All right, so for pain assessment, what do you guys mostly do? Let's say you're in clinical, your patient says, hey, can you tell the nurse I need something for pain? What do you guys ask the patient? You always go to for the pain scale, yeah? Yeah. yeah. Pain scale is only one aspect. Okay. okay. And all right. So we have to do a comprehensive pain assessment. So we'll discuss pain assessment and then we'll also need to use an appropriate pain assessment tool, appropriate for patient's age, cognitive ability, as well as mental status. So let's begin. A few things though. Chart 9-1. We need to acknowledge these these strategies, okay? So strategies to use when the patient's pain report of pain is not accepted, meaning they they have uh, some cognitive or physical limitations, for instance, wherein it's not it's impossible to to take their self report. Okay, so uh, read the first one, please. Ms. Zibi? Is okay, Jennifer. Okay, that's pretty clear, right? Okay, so keep your opinion to yourself. Uh, what is our role again? To accept the patient's self-report. All right, number two. I'll repeat. Vital signs changes or the absence of which does not prove or disprove pain. Hey, there is no proof of pain. It's totally subjective. Are we clear? All right. Number three. And we'll have more on that as we go through the next paragraphs. And last, ask what? Ask why it is so difficult to believe that person. All right. It's easy to stereotype people once we learn of their history. So let's say this patient has been in and out of your ER and multiple ERs. 
Okay, they shop around, for instance. Let's say they're drug users as well. They're known to be addicted to opioids. Don't tell me it's easy for you to believe that they're in pain. Be honest. Very hard, right? Make, you, you, you're going to say in your mind, you, this patient's making it very difficult for me to, to take their subjective report. Right? So these are some of the challenges. But again, can you prove or disprove that they have no pain? No. Now, don't impose this on the physician. Are we clear? So this is a nursing course, all right? We're studying for the NCLEX. For the NCLEX, do we ask the patient to prove it? No. Now, when you see doctors handle these, especially ER physicians, when they see these people come in, uh, and, and their history. Now, some physicians will turn them away, refuse to give them anything, right? Again, that is not our business. Are we clear? So as nurses, what is our role again? Accept the patient's self-report with no qualifications. Okay. Yes, ma'am. I have a question. Uh, I heard like a hearing in visual cause the pain too. Say again? Like a visual of hearing, like uh, of drugs. Like yeah. Opioid drugs. It was a pain. Is it true or not? The which? What did you, the first thing? The withdrawal causes pain. Ah, withdrawal. Yeah. Yes. Some of the symptoms of withdrawal, which we will discuss today, uh, is pain. Is some of the symptoms, especially abdominal pain. Yes, that's that's true. Yeah, it's true. Okay, we'll get to that mm -hmm. when we go to, um, that will fall under complications. Or no, not complications, challenges. And here's a QSIN. We, we repeat again. So this, um, this reinforces the subjective nature of the patient's report, self-report of pain. All right. So we're expected to perform a comprehensive pain assessment. So don't just, don't train yourself to always asking, okay, how bad is it? Zero to 10. And then you go medicate the patient. No, complete a pain assessment. Plus you need to anyway. So when you're working, I don't know if you work in Epic, but when you go to Epic under pain, whenever you put anything other than zero on the pain level, it opens a, a drop-down box asking you all of these questions. Okay, so you're required to fill it out. Number one will be location. So it'll ask you, where's the pain? Intensity is just one aspect. With intensity, we have various tools. We'll get to chart 9-2 in order to use an appropriate pain intensity scale to use for each type of patient based on patient's cognitive ability or mental status. So here's chart 9-2. This is how to use a pain rating scale. I won't read it for you. It's self-explanatory. Let's go to other assessments. So we said location, intensity. What else? So for intensity, these are the various tools. You can use the numeric rating scale. So who would be most appropriate to use this on? Adults. Adults. What about older children? Yeah, seven, eight. Yeah. Ten. yeah, they can do this. They can handle this now. So how much more adolescence, right? Okay. Or all throughout adulthood. Okay, as long as the patient doesn't have dementia, you can use the numeric pain, uh, pain rating scale. Wong Baker faces, so this obviously would be for younger children. Yeah, you know, preschool children, would this one would be appropriate. Or let's say also uh, toddlers. Well, the pain assessment tools come in different languages, so that shouldn't be a problem. You can simply search online and there should be one available in every language. All hospitals are required, especially in New York, so we're all required to make every handout, every information, like pamphlets, for instance, available in all languages. That's uh, required by law.
some of these are combinations of tools, meaning they'll both have a visual, you know, faces plus numbers with them. So they can be, in fact, when some of these, when you look at it, you don't see much difference between the Wong Baker faces and the faces page rating scale, for instance. The verbal descriptor, BDS, this is using words, okay, with um, also with a, with a picture, right, along with it. So like I said, there's a combination here between pictures and words or descriptions. There's also the visual analog. These are not very popular because again, they they are their their purpose is already met by the Wong Baker faces or the faces pain rating scale. So that's why these are not popular because okay? other tools are readily available or let's say easier to use than these. Next is the quality. So next drop down is quality. So describe the pain. It's best to not give the patient suggestions, allow them to describe it in their own words. So if their description is not in the drop down, let's say the description is so long. So let's say it's like a tractor is is you know running over me. Just nothing on that on the on the drop down. Drop down with just ache, dull, burning, sharp, stabbing. That's it. There's no tractor running over the tractor here. Okay. So mm -hmm. if that's the case, then put it in the comment. Okay. You put it under other. Okay. That's the patient. You put it in quotation marks. That's the patient's description. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, we get to that on their um, aggravating, you know, what, what uh, makes it worse, what makes it better. Yeah, we'll get to that. Okay, so after quality, which is the description, we go to onset and duration. When did it start? How long does it last? And then after that would be what you're talking about. So aggravating and mitigating factors. What makes it worse? What makes it better? And then effect on their function and quality of life. So again, don't don't um, suggest anything to the patient. Just ask them, okay, how does the pain affect you? So most of them will say, well, I can't sleep. I can't go to work. I can't go to the bathroom. Okay, I can't breathe well, All right? Or let's say I'm. it's making me stressed. It's making me aggravated. So that's how you, what you write. Because under effect, it will just be blank. It's free text. There's no drop down for the effect. Okay, so you have to type that. Okay, let's go to hierarchy of pain measures. Now, the hierarchy is going to help guide you on how to exhaust your pain relief measures. What do you see or observe in clinical when you go or during your clinical days. What do nurses automatically do when the patient complains of pain? Go to the mark, correct? All right. So most nurses, including myself, forget that there are non-pharmacologic pain measures and we only use them if we have nothing else. Because of course, the, some doctors will give you a hard time like, no, I'm not giving any more. Let's say the patient's pain was not relieved after three or four different medications and they're not due yet. The patient's already ringing. Okay, so, and it's all still early. It's only 8 p.m. You have 11 hours to go. So now you 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 resort to the non-pharmacologic now. So you, you start with music, you know, massages now or distraction, right? Because you have nothing else. You, know, you you start with ice packs. Oh, why didn't I think of this? Okay, so you got ice packs now, or um, you know, let's say you got some uh, lotion you can put on. All right, you or you can, huh? Massages. Oh yeah, I do. Of course, with the clothes on. Okay, and then no music, and then oh, I'm in my scrubs. I don't wear anything. You know. Yeah. 
It's not that kind of massage. Okay, so here we are. When patients cannot self-report pain, we do have other tools. We'll get to them shortly. All right, so here's the hierarchy. So we use this as a guide on how to uh, use to choose which pain relief measures we need to we need to use. Okay, so always use a standard pain assessment tool. That way your assessment is comprehensive and is professional, right? You're not you know, just winging it. So you use an actual tool. On EPIC, this would be under vital signs because pain is a six vital sign, correct? So it's all under the vital signs tab under the flow sheet. So under the when you get to the pain intensity, remember I said whenever you put a number more than one, I mean more than zero, it will automatically ask you for a, a comprehensive pain assessment. So one of the tools that will pop up will be, so let's say uh, under uh, pain assessment. So number one would always be the numeric pain scale. That's by default. But when you click on the drop down, it will show you different tools. So what will come up there is pain ad, which is the one we use for dementia patients or confused patients. It doesn't have to be dementia. Anyone with the confusion meaning they cannot verbalize the, the their pain description. Okay? But however, you see it in their behavior, in their breathing, in their, in their sounds that they're making, their uh, activity level. Okay? We'll, we'll get to that shortly. And be patient, especially with those patients with changes in mental status. Let's say they had a stroke or they have dysphagia, you no know, slurred speech, or Parkinson's, for instance. They, they have a hard time communicating. So just be patient. Allow extra time. Right. Uh, we'll discuss what the meaning of aphasia, whatever Jennifer is saying, because there are different variations on that another time. So there are pain assessment tools for all of these patients. So when you have a patient on a vent, meaning they're sedated, we have a pain assessment tool for that. It's all similar to the pain ad. Or have you heard of FLAC? Although a pain assessment tool we use for infants, babies. Okay, so they're all based on um, that type of tool, meaning all we can assess is the patient's behavior. And depending on the behavior, let's say for breathing, there's a number attributed. So let's say if the breathing is normal, no increased respiratory rate, that's zero. Once the patient has respiratory rate higher than 20, then that's a one. And then when the patient is in distress, for instance, that's a two. All right. And then there are about five categories, five behaviors that we, what, that we grade under the pain ad. It will be similar with FLAC. Okay, FLAC is just designed for infant. Of course, an infant has a higher heart rate and a higher respiratory rate, correct? So that would be uh, different. And do you see a old person kicking their legs like a baby? No, right? Only babies can do that, right? So therefore, there are specific behaviors that are only seen in an infant, okay? Not seen in a grown ass dementia patient okay <laughs> so here they are number three so these are the categories in that pain assessment tool so these are for people with dementia with uh, babies or nonverbals or unconscious patients look at we look at the facial expressions and there's a description for each one so if there's grimacing that's one or the patient has you know like like this uh, obvious distress that's a two Okay, and then you add up the score, that's your pain score. All right, and then we medicate or we intervene based on those total numbers. Mm. Are we clear? Yeah. Now, surrogate, we don't always use this uh, unless it's really a primary caregiver because these primary caregivers, let's say the spouse, the parent, 
those who are with this patient 24 seven, are they in a position to know the patient best than everybody else? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, because they observe, they can tell you that, oh yeah, that's what he does when he's he has discomfort, okay? So we can use surrogates, okay? If available. Then mm -hmm. other physical indicators again. So let's say, uh, what does what does this say again? Thank you for reading the first two statements on number four. Samuel. Thank you, Samuel. Oh, Samuel, sorry. No, go ahead. Evaluate physiologic indicators with the understanding that they are the least sensitive indicators of pain and may signal the existence of conditions other than pain or a lack of the patients quickly adapt physiologically despite pain and may have normal or below normal body time in the presence of severe pain. The overriding principle is that the absence of an elevated blood pressure or heart rate does not mean the absence of pain. Okay, so I rest my case, all right? Mm -hmm. So I rest, I hope you understand that Please don't use vital signs as a proof or indicator of your pain. Oh. And none of the tools that we mentioned earlier, you know, the faces, the numeric pain scale, the pain ad, the flak, none of them include vital signs. None, none. They include behaviors like leg activity, consolability, but not vital signs. Are we clear? Okay, so vital signs is the least effective. A least effective or sensitive indicator. But I still wonder, especially down south when I was working there. So we had pain management doctors there that gave orders to, okay, please document vital signs every time the patient reports pain. And I go, what the hell is this? Where did this come from? Hey, this, the textbooks don't say anything like this. <clears throat> but then it's an order. Okay, fine. But... I mean, what for, right? It's not like you can prove it, you know, send it to the <clears throat> in court, you know, or or to the insurance company because it's a proven fact. They are not reliable okay? because the body adapts, especially if it's chronic pain, the body adapts. Then there's no more vital signs changes. Maybe for someone who's who's not accustomed to pain. So let's say someone uh, has an acute appendicitis and then it ruptured. So during his painful episode, yeah, he may have, yeah, increased heart rate, increased blood pressure, for instance. So, but is it present in everybody? No. And what does this say again? It's, 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 it, it will only signal the existence of conditions other than pain, all right, or the lack of it. So they don't prove or disprove pain. And then an analgesic trial. So you want to use a multimodal approach here. The doctor should already be aware. So when we have a patient dealing with acute or chronic pain, they will prescribe different types of medications. If there's an opioid choice. There's also non-opioid. And for those patients with chronic pain, we, we better manage it with round the clock. Uh, and then they're adapting the same strategy for acute pain, for instance. So let's say for common surgical procedures, let's say, especially if it's laparoscopic. Do you know what laparoscopic is? Yes. No, when there's no big incision. They make small. Yeah, they mo make small one-inch incisions and they put used a robot, okay, to, to put instruments through those small holes and then perform the surgery, okay, meaning small incisions, meaning they recover faster, right? Okay. So for those patients... They only give Tylenol, IV Tylenol, every six hours, 1,000 grams every six hours. So that's four grams. That's the maximum for the day, right? So they give it around the clock. Whether the patient's in pain or not, no. They give it for 24 to 48 hours. And it's been very effective. Only for those types of surgeries, though. Okay? Uncomplicated surgeries like that. Let's say gastric surgeries. Uh, but of course, will it work? Will Tylenol work for a knee replacement? No. 
of course, that's a different level of pain. You, you, you understand? Okay, so certain types of surgical procedures, Tylenol, IV, four grams total might work, but not for, say, joint surgeries okay? or open heart surgeries. So those are higher level of pain. So for dementia, here's the tool. So we use uh, pain ad. Uh, here's the rest of it. So we got FLAC for infants and young children. So FLAC stands for that facial expression, leg movement, activity, crying, consolability. And then here's pain ad for the dementia, again, based on behavior. The behavior is similar to the FLAC because they're all based on behavior. But of course, there's no leg, you know, leg movement in uh, in the pain ad. Because, okay, I mean, grown-ass people don't do that. <laughs> and there's CPOT. This is what we use for critical care. No, those on a vent, those who are sedated. But all again, all of them are based on the same behavior as with the FLAC. Right? Because that's all we can assess. These patients are nonverbal. Right? Have you seen an infant talk? They do. That's it's crazy. Yes. What system would be fall under? No system. System for what would fall under? No system. What system would be fall under? What do you mean? What system? Oh, body system. Oh no, this would be under neuro. Yeah. Because pain is subjective, so yeah, pain. it's a it's a awareness, you know. Um, okay, so if we assess pain, then we also should be reassessing. This is automatic. This will show up on your work list, no matter what type of EHR you're using. Whenever there's pain, it will ask you for the intervention, which could be pharmacologic, non-pharmacologic. And then based on that, there's always a reassessment. It will not disappear from your work list unless you address it. Meaning you have to see what is the effect of your action or inaction on the pain level. Did it resolve on its own? Okay, two hours later or one hour later or 30 minutes later. So reassessment is necessary. The duration of your, no, the interval of your, Reassessment depends on your intervention. So let's say if it's an IV opioid that you use, what do you think is the time for reassessment? Shorter, longer? Shorter, about 30 minutes. If you gave up oral pill an hour later, okay, et cetera. Go to management now. So I mentioned earlier, it's going to be a multimodal approach. Okay? Do not be a one-trick pony. Don't just go to the MAR and, and do medications. Okay, There are non-pharmacologic pain relief measures. Can you want to do some yoga? Yeah. So non-pharmacologic, definitely there's no, there's no little to no side effects, right? With pharmacologic, there are always side effects and contraindications as well. So let's start with pharmacologic. Again, multimodal. Don't use just one. If the doctor only orders one, then suggest something. All right, so send a message. We do that now for Epic. You can send a message. You don't have to talk to the doctor. Especially, you know, if you don't like each other. So you can just text. Okay? Send a text message. You don't have to face each other. Okay, So talk through the messaging system. Routes. Preferably, we should use the oral route. It's the least harmful of all the routes. Less side effects as well. And it's more natural, correct? Because we eat, we don't normally inject, right? 
uh, substance. Do you inject food? Do yeah, let me get steak uh, into my uh, into my belly. No. Okay, so we take it by mouth. Uh, however, consider certain limitations. Let's say the patient is NPO, then of course you can't give it orally. Or let's say the patient's here for a abdominal problem. Okay, so patient can't take anything by mouth. Or maybe there's a absorption problem. So the oral route is not an option. Depending also on the period. So if it's immediate period, acute pain, so will oral be the best initial approach? You may want to start with parenteral first, IM, IV, sub -Q, And then gradually switch the patient to oral because can we continue IV administration at discharge? No, you're going to have to discharge the patient on oral. So start weaning them off the IV and start using the oral in preparation for discharge. Rectal, especially if the patient has any nausea vomiting associated with the condition that causes the pain. So you can use the suppositories. They're just as, uh, in fact, rectal route is more effective than the oral. It's faster, it's absorbed faster through the rectal route. So there are more blood vessels there and it, it's faster. Okay, so the, the drug doesn't have to go through the stomach. Okay, mm -hmm. so if you go to the rectal, I'm not saying put the tablet into the rectum. No. Okay, that's not appropriate. Tablet is designed to be through the mouth. Of course, I'm referring to suppositories, okay, because it's a different form formulation now. So it's designed for direct absorption into the bloodstream. And it goes both ways. Don't give the suppository by mouth. Regarding suppositories, <clears throat> mucous membranes are the same. What I'm trying to say is sometimes I do miss the, <clears throat> the rectum. You know, in the female, for instance, say the patient moves, right? Remember, there's a very few centimeters between the vagina and the rectum. So sometimes, not all the time, I can count maybe two, three times in my lifetime that it went to the wrong hole. But the patient's pain was relieved. So I guess mucous membranes are mucous membranes. Okay? Yeah. I mean, it's a, it's a medication. It's not like I put feces into the vaginal canal. I put a medication in there. What I'm saying is it wasn't designed, but it's about the same mucous membrane. Okay, They still have blood vessels, so... I'm not saying don't to do that, okay? But because the thing is, once you use a lubricant and then the patient squeezes the butt as you go, the torpedo kind of have their own mind now and you can't retrieve it all the time. So when you try to retrieve, retrieve it, it only goes so further and then you try to grab it some more. Now the patient's looking at you, what are you doing? <laughs> You could be charged with assault now. Okay, dosing regimen. <clears throat> so these are the, uh, well, we don't really decide this. It's the doctor. However, please know that, um, understand titration. Titration means adjusting. If you can titrate up, meaning increase the dose, as you go, you can always also titrate down. It go, always goes both ways. How you decide, well, how is the patient reacting? Now, for the scheduling, around the clock is best con check, uh, compared to PRN. PRN is as needed, right? So PRN is a Latin word, <clears throat> which means as the need arises. That's pro renata. <clears throat> And that's uh, as the circumstance arises or as needed. Examples of this would be NSAIDs. NSAIDs work best if you give it round the clock rather than as needed because they need to build a 
steady drug level in, in your bloodstream. So that's when they work. Okay. They work best, I should say. PCA, you remember this uh, in fundamentals? Okay, under pain, right? So the only requirement of a PCA is, of course, the patient is in severe pain. Why do we put them on a PCA? To, for a more effective pain relief, okay? So meaning the patient controls when they get the medication, not wait for the nurse. Because nurses can be busy, right? We're not trying to be cruel, but we have other priorities, okay? So we have competing priorities. Now we'd like to be only with one patient, but that's not how it works. We have multiple patients. So to avoid that, the patient is given control. Keep in mind, PCA is not only IV. We have other routes. We have oral meaning we have PCA machines that dispense a pill. We have the IV, which is most popular. We also have sub-Q, epidural, and perineural. Okay, there are other routes. Of course, the most popular is IV. Most drugs used for IV are hydromorphone, which is diluted, morphine, most popular. We have fentanyl. We also have... Uh, Demerol or meperidine. Most common, of course, is morphine. Now, is it dangerous? Yes, yes. patient time. could OD. So therefore, and what is the most, uh, the earliest sign of an overdose? Respiratory. Respiratory depression. So therefore, what will we monitor in the patient while on PCA? Pulse ox. Okay, so because what will happen to the pulse ox if the patient's respiratory rate drops below 10 per minute? What will happen to the oxygen saturation? It will also drop. Okay, so therefore, pulse ox would be your best indicator. I mean, you can't sit there, stare at the patient. So you just need a continuous pulse ox, set the alarm that it falls below 92 or 90, for instance, it will beep, and then you go see the patient. You see the patient's respiratory rate below 10, then you administer naloxone, okay, Narcan. All right, since the patient has to use this, what's the only or most important requirement? Cognitive ability to use it. Are we clear? So can I give this to an unconscious patient? How are they going to press the button? And we can't have PCA by proxy. You can have a family member or the nurse press it for them. Okay, you say, oh, based on my FLAC or my pain ad score, it's a, it's a six. Okay, let me press the button for you. No, there's no PCA by proxy. Patient has to press it themselves. What if the patient is paraplegic? No, quadriplegic. Can't move anything below the neck. They're in pain, severe pain. So you're going to deprive them? No, sir. You have no finger. You cannot press the button. Okay, that is not a reason. They can still get a PCA. We do have other ways to activate the button. We can give them straws, okay, which can activate the machine. Okay, so they can just simply blow into the straw. All right? Yeah, we, can, we have other ways to activate the button. So don't be um, prejudicial, okay? Don't say, oh. You don't have fingers, okay? Mm -hmm. Or you can't move your arms. No, they can get a PCA. Okay. okay, let's look at the settings because again, there's danger here. Let me ex explain a few things. Basal rate is not always ordered. Basal rate on a PCA means the patient gets a medicine every hour whether they press the button or not. Are we clear? Let's say they get 0 0.1 milligrams every hour or morphine. That's a basal rate. Okay, They don't have to press the button. The pump will give them 0 0.1 or whatever the dose ordered is every hour. Are we clear? That's basal rate. Now, the PCA rate is how much they'll get when they press the button. Doctor again prescribes that. 
what if the patient presses the button 1 million times? <laughs> Don't worry about it because there's a 15 minute lockup. What is a 15 minute lockup? That means every 15 minutes, even if they press it 2 million times, the pump will only give them one dose every 15 minutes. So again, basal rate, which not all patients will get one. There's everybody will get a 15 minute lockup. Okay, that's set. That's default. Sometimes there's adjustment, then they'll say 10 minutes or 20 minutes, but most settings are 15 minutes. They need a that frequent. Yeah, that's PCA. But again, there's only so much they can get. Okay, so let's say 0 0.2, 0 0.1 every 15 minutes. The only use of the, when, when we see, because it registers the number of times they press the button on the pump. So you can see there how many times have they pressed it in the last hour. So that means if you see there 999 times, what is the explanation? Patient's pain is not relief. Or you can investigate. How come you press, I see you press the button a million times? You have nothing else to do? Or maybe they'll say, they'll tell you, okay, no, it's just really in pain. Okay? Or maybe they put a bump stop on the button, you know, made it automatic. <clears throat> so we already discussed the continuous pulse ox. Okay, that's to ensure they don't OD without us knowing. And, oh, uh, the last one is the four-hour limit. <clears throat> so basal rate, PCA rate, 15-minute lockout, and four-hour limit, meaning in every four hours, the patient won't get a maximum dose. You understand so far? Any question on a PCA? Okay, let me show you a picture in case you've never seen a PCA pump. <clears throat> It depends on the type of IV pump the hospital uses. So look, let's look at the Alaris series. <clears throat> okay, so this is the Alaris pump, PCA yeah. pump. Uh, everybody has phones, right? Yes. Okay, so search PCA pump and then look for uh, something called Alaris, A-L-A-R-I-S. Mm -hmm. You see it? Mm -hmm. Check on images. Just look for the picture of a pump, uh, a PCA pump. Yeah, see. All right. So there's a key, right? You see a key? All right. So the pump has a key because this is a huge bag or vial that we put in there of narcotics. So it's a 50 or 100 ml bag of morphine, hydromorphone. That's a lot of opioids, right? So can it be stolen? Yes. By nurses? Yes. By patients? All right. So there has to be accountability and security. The key, you need a key to open and close the PCA pump. There's only one key in each nurse station. In the nursing unit, there's only one key. 
The key is kept in the medication dispensing cabinet. So you need the biometrics to access those. So you need to log in with your fingerprint, open, get the key, and you're expected to return it as well. So at all times, we see who took the key and was it returned or not. So that whenever there's something going on, let's say, oh, you have a PCA missing, or let's say the patient with this was discharged, what happened to the leftover PCA, okay, the, the, the narcotic? So it has to be accounted for. How much did the patient use? How much was left over? All right. And who, who discarded it? Who wasted it? Who was the witness? Because you need a witness in order yeah. to discard it. Again, the key is the, the evidence. All right. So who took it so that when we are missing something, we know who to investigate. All right. So every, every time you have something like that, there will always be two suspects because can one accomplish this task without a accomplice? No. Impossible. So you need someone to, to work with. Yeah, make sure you get the bigger half so it makes it worth it. Okay. So that's the PCA pump. Okay, there are different brands, but all of them have a lock. Okay, and that's always the procedure everywhere. All right, that's it for the PCA. Let's go now to the medications. There are three groups of pharmacologic interventions. So we've got non-opioids, we've got opioids, which is the largest group. And then we have co-analgesics, also called adjuvant analgesic agents. Examples of non-opioids are Tylenol, NSAIDs, and we've got, uh, yeah, tramadol is an opioid though. Uh, tramadol, or are you take, talking about toradol? Mm. Tramadol or Ultram is an opioid. Yeah, it's an opioid. It's a mild opioid. It's the weakest among opioids. And what was the other name that started with the T that you just said? Uh, toradol or Ketorolac is, you know, it can be mistaken. Tramadol, Toradol. Um, but uh, Toradol, which is Ketorolac, is an NSAID. It's, an, it's the only IV NSAID. And then you've got Ultram, the weakest of all. There used to be Darvacet, but Darvacet disappeared. I don't know what happened to Darvacet. So now we still have Ultram. <clears throat> so we got morphine, hydromorphone, fentanyl, oxycodone, oxycontin also. Then we've got uh, co-analgesics. Now co-analgesics aren't really analgesics. What are co-analgesics? They are anesthetics. Anticonvulsants, which means they include gabapentin, um, uh, no, that would be under um, anesthesia, so sedatives. And then we've got antidepressants also, particularly um, anti, uh, no, uh, uh, tri, uh, amitriptyline. Uh, or tricyclic, sorry, tricyclic antidepressants are very effective in treating. You remember the neuropathic pain, no limb, limb, um, phantom limb pain, that kind of thing, shingles. So we use uh, gabapentin, and then we've got Cymbalta, Lyrica. So those are the we call them adjuvant analgesics because are they analgesics? No, they are antidepressants. They are anticonvulsants or anti seizure medications. They're anesthetics. Okay. They're not really for pain, but they are effective in treating pain. A different type of pain though, the neuropathic pain. Let's start with non-opioids. They have some side effects as well, okay, just like opioids. Okay, they're not all harmless. Let's talk about the most common ones. 
So here are again the indications. So I mentioned Tylenol earlier, which is used in several minor surgeries and they're very effective. They can be combined with opioids as well. In fact, we have combinations two in one pill, such as let's say Percocet. Percocet is oxycodone and Tylenol. Then we also have, uh, right, uh, Tylenol with codeine. Okay, that's Tylenol number three. Okay, so it's a combination uh, medications. Or they can also be separate. We start with Tylenol. So the number one contraindication here or side effect is liver toxicity. You, so you can't use it with people with elevated liver enzymes. Uh, IV acetaminophen. So we were part of this. I remember in 2005 when they first started this out. It was a big study. There was a lot of people there no, not staff, you know, from the pharmaceutical company, their lab coats and taking data. <laughs> Get out of my way. <laughs> so it's a 15 minute infusion. So it's a 100 ml glass vial. So therefore, how many mLs per hour? It's 15 minutes. 100 ml over 15 minutes. So how many mLs per hour? Um. Come on, four hundred mLs per hour. Okay, so NSAIDs. So the NSAIDs are ibuprofen, naproxen. In case you're wondering why isn't aspirin mentioned here, we do not use aspirin. It's an NSAID, but we don't use it for pain. Are we clear? Okay, so long ago, when you see people still saying, hey, can I take an aspirin for a headache? These are the boomers, okay? These are people born in that area uh, during that era. We don't use aspirin for pain anymore. Are we clear? So aspirin is used for antiplatelets now. Okay. But of course, people buy aspirin because it's over-the-counter I still see people taking aspirin, but they shouldn't really. Sorry? How it helps with the hangover, like alpha gensir? Well, any um NSAIDs are when when we say NSAIDs, they uh, they inhibit uh, prostaglandin, correct? And prostaglandin is a vasodilator. So therefore, uh the headache, if you have a hangover, it's really caused by tyramine. Because alcohol has tyramine, right? That's a potent vasodilator. So if you give a drug that will inhibit prostaglandin synthesis, therefore you're causing vasoconstriction. So therefore, a headache is caused by vasodilation, meaning increased intracranial pressure. So if you decrease the size of the blood vessels, then there's no more increased ICP, no more headache. Okay. Or the best would be stay drunk. Okay, Do not... <laughs> Do not put yourself in a hangover. Okay? Keep drinking. Is that why when someone has a hangover, what makes them feel better the next day? Is that they, like, for instance, if someone drank beer and then they wake up, I had a grandmother that would do that. She would get drunk. She lived well, morning, yeah. I she, like your grandma. She would have a beer to make her hangover go away. Oh, okay. <laughs> I never understood the science. I don't know. It. That doesn't really work. She's just a drunk, basically, she, she, all right? She did have a problem. Yeah. Which is good. I mean, we all die anyway, right? Yeah. Those who don't drink just look good in the coffin. That's the only difference. Okay. Okay. NSAIDs, uh, over-the-counter, very effective, okay, non-opioid option. The problem with this is, let's go to the side effects later. So the I, I already mentioned IV formulation is ketorolac. Here's the adverse effects. So there are three groups of side effects for uh, non-opioids, particularly for Tylenol, we said liver toxicity, hepatotoxicity. So the I know this says here, 
um, daily dose, the textbook says daily dose of 3,000 milligrams, correct? Now, this is oral. IV, it's four grams. Are we clear? Okay. Oral, three grams. IV, four grams. Okay. Be careful with combinations, like I said earlier, Percocet or Vicodin, Lortab. These are the combination. You know, they're all oxycodone and Tylenol. Please count the Tylenol content of that as well. Because sometimes they take Tylenol separately and then also Percocet, Lortab, Vicodin. They also contain Tylenol. Sometimes patients forget. They just say, I didn't take Tylenol. I took ibuprofen so I can take this Tylenol. Well, no, don't forget. This thing has Tylenol too. All right? So that's for Tylenol. NSAIDs, there are three serious side effects here. One is cardiovascular. They've been associated with increased cardiovascular risk and, comor and um, mortality, meaning the patient already has heart disease, okay? Meaning it doesn't cause heart disease. It's only harmful if the patient has heart disease and then takes NSAIDs, all right? So it's been associated with increased mortality, meaning they have a cardiac event. Okay, again, has something to do with inhibiting prostaglandin. So it causes vasoconstriction. So therefore, it will cause coronary vasoconstriction, ischemia. Next group is the ulcers. So same action. They cause vasoconstriction because they inhibit prostaglandin, which is a vasodilator. So they, they destroy the mucus producing cells in the GI tract. So without mucus in your GI tract, what's going to protect your GI tract from your own acids? No, we rely on that mucus, right? Me constant mucus production to protect our own gut, our, no, our bowel walls from the strong acid. Remember, these acids can melt, melt metal. So if there's no protection, what will they do to the bowels? Cause ulcers. Oh, oh. Third is kidney damage. So again, because of their vasoconstricting properties, they destroy nephrons. Okay? Because nephrons also have microscopic capillaries, right? So they're also affected by the vasoconstricting properties of NSAIDs, leading to chronic kidney disease. All right. So some uh, on this paragraph, some NSAIDs are less harmful than other NSAIDs. For instance, COX-2 inhibitor, inhibitor this, is, this is the selicoxib, have less, uh, what does this say? Less cardiovascular adverse effects. Okay. So the, not all NSAIDs are created equal. Let's just put it that way. Of course, always consult your doctor before you take anything over the counter. Okay, so we discussed cardiovascular, GI, and then kidney. Now, for those who have to take NSAIDs, uh, this mentioned here that they will have to take PPIs. Did you see that right here? P proton pump inhibitors for those who have to take NSAIDs for chronic pain and to protect them from getting ulcers. So they'll be put on more drugs. So you're taking NSAIDs? Okay, take PPIs also to reduce the acid level, so to protect you from ulcers. Which PPIs would they normally uh, put all. on? So any of them? Yeah, we put on PPI. Any questions on opioid, non-opioids? Okay, let's go to, I mean, uh, opioids now. So there are two groups of opioids. We have true MU opioids, which have no analgesic sealing. And there are non-MU opioids right here on the second paragraph, uh, which are now agonist, antagonist opioids, uh, which have uh, an analgesic sealing. What does the sealing mean? What does the sealing mean? Okay, there's a limit, right? Okay. So when we say analgesic sealing, there's a limit to the dosing of the opioid. True 
MU agonists, which is morphine, hydromorphone, fentanyl, those things have no analgesic ceiling. What does that mean? The doctor can increase the dose, not, of course, indiscriminately, meaning these people develop tolerance, correct? What is tolerance? Okay, so Maria, when when you started drinking, how much alcohol made you tipsy? One glass. Now? No, I can drink 10. Gallons, right? Okay. So you developed tolerance. tolerance. So tolerance means you require more doses of a substance to achieve the same effect, right? That's what tolerance means. So the more you take something, especially opioids, then the more tolerance you, you, you develop. So doctors understand this. So therefore, if the patient develops tolerance, they will keep increasing the dose without fear of overdosing. Are we clear? However, they have to stop at one at some point because yes, you can, there is no analgesic ceiling. However, there's also more side effects especially constipation. So there, there comes a point where in the dosing, you know, don't think that the doctor will give you 100 milligrams of morphine. No, we won't get to that because the side effects will limit, is the dose limiting factor, not the overdose concern. Are we clear? Meaning we come to a point where this doesn't make any sense. You're not pooping you know, you're pooping monthly now, right? So it doesn't make any sense. So we have to change to another medication, all right? So that's the dose-limiting uh, factor. It's the side effects. That's why we, we don't go over. But as far as the dosing for the medication, these drugs here, uh, fentanyl, oxycodone, morphine, they have no analgesic ceiling. There is no limit. Are we clear? However, the others, the non-MU agonists, which are the uh, buprenorphine, nalbuphine, butorphanol, they have an analgesic ceiling. Okay, there's a limit. They're dangerous. So they only have so much you can, the doctor can prescribe. The opioids work again by altering the pain receptor sites. You no, know, tricks the brain into there is no pain, bro. Okay, there is no pain, so it just alters the perception of the pain. Pain is there; they just can't feel it because the doc, the brain is not interpreting it as pain anymore. The gold standard is morphine for opioids, followed by hydromorphone. If you compare the two, I mean, all of these come from op op um, opium, right? They all came from the same plant. They just have different formulations. For example, between morphine and hydromorphone, hydromorphone is about five to seven times stronger than morphine. So the dosing would be way different. So you'll require more of morphine, but only less of hydromorphone. Other things to consider is also why different types? Well, we have to decide. Let's say you have a patient on dialysis. Morphine is not good for people on dialysis. Hydromorphone, however, is the lesser evil. So you can place the patient on hydromorphone if they are on dialysis, but not morphine. Okay. Uh, correct. Yeah, something with the renal excretion. Uh, fentanyl, the fentanyl here is from the pharmaceutical company, okay? This is not the trafficked uh, fentanyl, which is, you know, who knows how they made it, okay? Those are the ones that really kill. Yeah, uh, I mean, they're not for pain, really. They're, they're designed to kill now, right? Uh, because, you know, it's, it's not a pharmaceutical company that made it. There's just people in the basement. And here are our antagonists, which are the antidotes. Okay, so we have naloxone, which is the most uh, popular. So they come in nasal sprays, tablets, and uh, parenteral options. Administration, again, we, we want oral as much as possible. 
then if it acute, then we can use a parenteral. Titration, same thing as earlier under the hierarchy chart. So you can titrate up, you can also titrate down. It's very important, especially when we're discharging the patient, you know, weaning them off. And we'll also talk about the, so here's the uh, analgesic ceiling, the, the ceiling effect I was talking about earlier. Okay, here's a guideline for using opioids, chart 9-5. Start with assessment. Okay, before you decide to use opioids, perform a comprehensive assessment. Is this really the right choice for this patient, for this particular type of pain? Consider side effects. Uh, there's also something we call, there's two sets of patients. We have opioid naive and we have veterans mm -hmm. or opioid tolerant. So we have opioid naive, opioid tolerant. Who are opioid naive? Anyone who's not usually taking opioids, then you are naive. You are at risk for overdose respiratory depression, and you'll die. Opioid-tolerant patients, however, you give them gallons of this thing, they'll be walking around, driving, going to work. Okay? They don't have the respiratory depression. They don't have the sedation. They don't have the nausea vomiting. None of those. Equinalgesia. Now, this is important to understand, and we have a guide. It's pretty simple. So doctors use this during discharge. Say the patient was on morphine, 10 milligrams IV during their hospital stay. When they prescribe a oral equivalent, they will have to base it on how much was the patient taking parenterally. There's an equivalent in the oral. Here's the table. 9-3. There's only three here, so it does not much to memorize because not all have a IV form. Okay, so morphine does. So morphine can be oral or parenteral. So that's equivalent. 30 of oral morphine is equal to 10 IV, vice versa. Fentanyl, no PO form. It does have a transdermal form. Okay, we have a patch, fentanyl patch, but no oral. Hydrocodone, same thing. There's no IV formulation for hydrocodone. So uh, hydromorphone, however, as it is available both PO and parenteral. And then finally, oxymorphone. So there's only three. What are they again? Morphine, hydromorphone, and oxymorphone. Clear? So only three. Can we see that again? Table nine dash three. Okay, so only three to memorize. Okay, we're wrapping up now, almost done. Let's talk about these three challenges. So we've got substance abuse disorder. This used to be called addiction. Now the medical term is SUD, substance use disorder, physical dependence, and then tolerance. Start with physical dependence. What is it? No. Well, this is when you like something, do you crave it? Yes. If something feels good, will you look for it? Yes. yes. A body likes it. So this is the nature of physical dependence. So the more you use something, and then we abruptly take it from you, what happens? You go into a withdrawal. It's a physical withdrawal, not just a psychological. Okay, so this is purely physical. And you have physical manifestations when you abruptly remove it okay, or deprive somebody of it. So what are the signs of withdrawal? Uh, it's later in the chapter. Tolerance. I already described it to you earlier. So Maria, 
she's alcohol tolerant now. So she requires gallons of it in order to achieve her fix. Okay. So same thing here. Who are at risk for tolerance? Young people. Tolerance can, can develop easily. It doesn't have to be weeks or months of opioid use. It can be days. But let's say you've been on the drug. Let's say you had surgery and we, we give you the uh, the drug um, over 48 or hours or longer. You start developing tolerance. By the way, physical dependence also the same. So physical dependence usually sets in about a week after using opioids or longer. Okay, there's a physical dependence. So some patients, let's say, don't understand when we prescribe them pills on opioids on this chart. So let's say we give the patient who had um, open heart surgery, right? So we give them, here, sir, here, sir. Uh, you're, you're going home now. So fill this prescription, okay? Then they'll ask, but I, have, I don't have any pain. So explain to them, yes, sir, that's why you don't have any pain because we've, we've been giving you opioids round the clock, okay? Because we don't have that, we we can't have them in pain. These are expensive uh, procedures. Okay, these are hundreds of thousands of dollars. So we can't have a, an unhappy patient. Okay, so they're drug round the clock. So of course they're comfortable. I never have any pain. Okay, so why do I need to fill this? So explain to them, sir. We've been drugging you pretty good. So when you go home without these, you're gonna go into withdrawal. Okay, some of them don't believe it. And then when you go visit them, oh, I had a hard time last night. Oh. You know, they have, we'll get to the manifestations uh, later. Okay, so they go into physical withdrawal and it's really, really unpleasant. So tolerance and then substance abuse disorder. Now, please bear in mind, this is not caused by using opioids. No, it's a combination of Factors, mostly psychological factors, because the patient now uses the drug for purposes other than pain. But someone, so let's say Zibi takes hydrocodone or oxycontin for pain. <laughs> Will she become addicted? Not necessarily because she has she has pain. So she's using it to relieve pain. However, when she no longer has pain, and she continues to use it. Is she addicted now? Yeah. Yes, that's what we call substance use disorder now. Because she, she's still using it for relieving pain. No, she's taking it for the for the high now. Okay. Yeah, so that's that's another thing. Okay, so that's now substance use disorder now. So again, so with SUD, use of opioid is for non-therapeutic reasons. Clear? So if someone takes it for sleep, is that's considered therapeutic? Yeah, because you can use something else. Yeah, it's why why do you use that one for sleep? Okay, there are non, there's melatonin, there's mirtazapine. You're pretty huh? sleep, right? Yeah, there are other medications for that. Which one? Okay, go to your provider. <laughs> Not me, you might buy on the street. So here are the manifestations of withdrawal. So we've got a combination. It's not just one patient may mm -hmm. have one, not the others, but they're all unpleasant. Look at this, anxiety, nausea, vomiting. Rhinitis, sneezing, chills, hot flashes, abdominal cramping. And these are severe abdominal cramping. Patient will be balled up on the floor, can't do anything. Tremors, diaphoresis, pyloerection, meaning goosebumps, and insomnia. Okay? Very um, unpleasant. We'll skip pseudo addiction. So we're only testing the three, which are? Physical dependence, tolerance, and substance use disorder. Withdrawal is part of physical dependence, meaning if you 
have physical dependence, then you will have withdrawal. Okay, and those are the manifestations. Very good, select all the reply question. Uh, okay, so we talked about opioid naive versus opioid tolerant. Who do you monitor again for overdose? The naive patient. And keep in note, there's no set time for the development of tolerance. can be as early as 48 hours. The younger the patient, then the higher the chances of tolerance. Uh, we've got, uh, we'll skip OIH. It's not really very common. Let's go to the most common side effects. Okay, uh, methadone is a unique opioid. So this is used to treat opioid addiction. So you give another opioid to treat opioid addiction. I mean, um, methadone is, is very effective okay, in treating, especially those with uh, heroin, okay, heroin addiction. Mm -hmm. So they benefit from methadone. It, of course, is not the only treatment, you know, you don't just prescribe, oh, you have addiction, here you go. It has to be combined with psychotherapy, okay? There has to be um, uh, another approach because, again, the as you looked at, as you read SUD earlier, was it just caused by the opioid? Mm -hmm. No, it's a combination of uh, several factors, right? Personal, psychological, emotional it not just the use of the substance. Uh, yes, they have specialized uh, staff uh, to, to handle um, various types of opioid addiction. Let's go to adverse effects of opioids and then we call it a day. So the most common are the following, constipation, nausea, vomiting, pruritus. Pruritus doesn't mean allergy, okay? Pruritus is just itching, but there's no breathing uh, symptoms, meaning there's no bronchoconstriction, okay? But they do itch. Same thing, my wife had this with Percocet, and she was convinced that she has an allergy. So until now, so she had that with her first um, C-section, right? She had four. So when she had the three other C-sections, she had not, not a single opioid at all. She just took ibuprofen. I don't know how that woman did it. Anyway, hypotension and sedation. These are the adverse effects. They go away with time. So as the patient becomes opioid tolerant, the side effects, these adverse effects go away except constipation. Constipation never goes away. Con constipation, in fact, gets worse the longer you take opioids. Are we clear? Mm -hmm. But as the patient, again, becomes opioid tolerant, do they still experience the adverse effects? Mm -hmm. No, except constipation. Constipation will persist. Will not go away. So be careful comb combining substances. Okay, when you're on opioids, because that will cause more harm. Say, combine it with alcohol, you could die. So here's the constipation rationale. Opioids result because they are CNS depressant, so they they chillax everything. So they chillax peristalsis as well, leading to constipation. Uh, nausea vomiting. When was the last time you felt nauseous? Was it a nice sensation? Mm -hmm. Terrible, right? The most, I can handle pain better than I can handle nausea. I, I don't like nausea. I can't eat. And you know I love to eat. Again, I emphasize pruritus is not an allergic reaction. Are we clear? 
Okay, so it's not an allergic reaction to opioids. It's just a adverse effect. So sedation and respiratory depression, this indicates an overdose. And what's the treatment again? Okay, so the key here is to identify it and then save a life. For co-analgesics, which are also called adjuvant analgesics, these are again the antidepressants, anti-seizure medications, and anal I mean uh, anesthetics. Okay. That's about it. Questions? Uh, we're not including that here. 